Thank you. All right, we've got almost 30 people on the call here, which is a great number. And I'm just gonna call it a, 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 a quorum for getting started, even though I don't think we're voting on anything today. So welcome everyone to our monthly hydrogen working group meeting. It's great to see everyone. Um, if you're in Anchorage, there's uh, lots of snow on the ground. And if you're somewhere else in the state, you may also have snow. So uh, I think winter is upon us here. Um, we always start with introductions for those who may be new to the group uh, or those who have been on and perhaps haven't introduced themselves previously. Uh, now is the time for you to let us know who you are. Please don't be shy. I think this is a very friendly group and um, we would love to know who you are and why and how you came to join us today if you're new. So go ahead and jump in or raise your hand. And uh, Patty, also, can you take off the AI assistant from Launch Alaska while we're at it, please? Yes, sounds good. Okay, any new participants? Scott Neumeister, um, I'm with uh, Mitsubishi Power, I'm new. Um, Aaron, I think we met each other um, remotely maybe a month ago. Um, one of my colleagues had, had uh, listened in on a webinar and that was the connection. So um, I am a director of our hydrogen infrastructure group focused on the, um, the Northwest uh, US, which I'm extending up to Can um, to Alaska for now, so <laughs> Canada and Alaska. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to join the group and interested to um, hear what's being discussed. Terrific, great. And Scott, if we could ask you to put your contact information in uh, the chat, we can include you in future distribution lists and others in the group can reach out to you if that's okay, sure, based on their do. interests. Thank you. Do we have any other new uh, participants on the crew? Hi, um, this is Harold Johnston. I'm a retired physician and interested in um, uh, methane conversion to hydrogen and hydrogen transport and just mostly kind of a spectator at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Harold. And where are you calling us from today? In Anchorage. In Anchorage, great. Would you mind also sharing your contact info in the chat? Um, and, yes, I can great. And Scott, I forgot to ask where you're calling from. I'm ca calling from Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, all right. Where, where I'm enjoying a beautiful, sunny 70, 70 degree day. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so a little bit far from the Northwest, but we'll, we welcome you all the same. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> any other new participants who would like to introduce themselves? Yeah, this is uh, Ivan Musman from uh, Mitsubishi. I'm the vice president of uh, strategic hydrogen market development, working on the U.S., Canada, and uh, working with Scott here on uh, several opportunities involved uh, in about eight different uh, hydrogen hubs in the U.S. and about three of them in Canada. Great. Of course, I want to know more. But for now, would you please put your contact information in the chat so that um, folks can reach out to you as they're interested? For sure. Thank you very much, Yvonne. Um, Brant, can I pick on you? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, my name is Brant. I'm a uh, I'm a grad student at UAF, and I'm planning I'm planning some PhD research on <clears throat> hopefully on the storage of hydrogen using different materials. And so I reached out to Aaron, and uh, we had a good conversation about that. But um, yeah, I'm hoping to learn a lot from the group and hopefully contribute something at some point too. So yeah, terrific. And Brant, if you're comfortable, please share your contact information in the chat. Um, Dan Smith, I see your introduction in the chat. If that's as much as you want to say, that's great. But if you also want to speak up, that would be great as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Um, come on camera and just say hi real quick. Hi, 
Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dan Smith, the Rural Energy Coordinator, or sorry, the State Energy Coordinator for Rural Development, uh, USDA Rural Development in Alaska. Um, and I have this meeting pop up all the time, um, and I'm just rarely able to hop on, but I have the opportunity this week, so I thought I'd listen in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other new faces or people who have been quiet and who now feel the need to introduce themselves? Don't be shy. It's a friendly group. Uh, my name is Eddie Delamary. I'm the Rural Energy Specialist at Tananachi's Conference or a tribal inter-tribal uh, organization or tribal consortium. Um, of composed of 42 tribal communities and I work with uh, all of these communities in the interior based out of Fairbanks to ensure that they have reliable um, energy and affordable energy as well. So we've been working on a, quite a lot of energy projects this year with all the influx of uh, federal uh, opportunities. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Mike McElhaney, your hand is up. Hey, thanks, Aaron. Uh, I was on these calls before, but haven't been on too often since you came on board. So, uh, I work for you. I do our international cooperation, including the Arctic. So I'm always happy to participate when time and schedule allow. Thank you. Thank you. Matt Bergen, your hand is yes, up. Good morning. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I was on a call. I thought I'd say hello from Kotzebue. It's a nice day today. Little just the right temperature in the teens to make some ice so we can get out of town on our snow machines. Um, yeah, looking forward to a hydrogen future when we don't have the stinky diesel fuel around anymore. Nice, thank except you. Except for emergencies. Except for except for emergencies. Okay, that's okay. Uh, the the last couple of you who have introduced yourselves, Mike, Matt, Edward, if you could um, put your contact info in the chat. Uh, if you're so inclined, we would appreciate it uh, so people can reach out and connect. Any other new faces or folks who haven't been on in a while? Hi, if I may speak. So my name is Pawan. I work with Jacobs Engineering and uh, we are currently helping few uh, native Indian Alaskan communities that really don't have access to uh, electrical infrastructure to be a resi to add resilience and decarbonization facilities into their existing grid. So I really look forward to uh, networking with the folks in this. Uh, I try to be on this, but you know, because of my other commitments, I hardly find time, but I look forward to connecting with the rest of the people here. Great, thank you, Pavan. And where are you calling us from today, Pavan? Uh, I'm currently in Florida. Okay. Traveling, so that's the reason why I couldn't turn on my video all right are you allowed to divulge what communities you're working with uh that i probably had to uh check with 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 the team <laughs> okay well i figure it couldn't hurt to ask yeah 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 thank you thank you please put your contact info in the chat if you are so inclined uh anybody else doug are you getting ready to speak there your box just lit up Oh, no, I'm just uh, just waiting for the agenda to continue. Okay, okay. Any other new faces? Introductions? I yeah, can't hi, help everybody. It. Uh, oh. This is uh, James Parkhurst. I'm with Mitsubishi Power. This is my uh, first time being able to join you all and looking forward to learn more about what's happening in Alaska. So thanks for the invite. Thank you. Appreciate your participation, James, please go ahead and uh, add your contact info to the chat so we can make sure you're included in future meetings and people can connect. I will say mm -hmm. that I can't help but notice Nathan's fur ruffed parka, even though he looks like he's inside a warm a warm building, uh, but- I have a cold office. <laughs> Must be really cold. Okay, any other new faces? Anyone who wants to introduce themselves? Can you hear me calling from New York? 
We can. I see Randolph. Please let us know who you are. Yes, thank you very much. I'm on my iPhone instead of my office suite, so it's I can't really see everything that's going on. Uh, but uh, I very much appreciate what you're doing uh, here on the opposite side of the lower 48. Uh, we're managing a, a practice for scaling up uh, zero carbon baseload power, not nuclear. And uh, we have a deficit of green electricity to run hydrolysis uh, all over the world, uh, all over the northeast of the lower 48. Uh, so. Um, one can well surmise that as we try to scale up a zero carbon electricity generation uh, in, in Alaska and in the interior, uh, that we need to look at other uh, baseload power non-nuclear alternatives. So I'd, I'd like to stay in touch with this group and, and we can talk about how to make a lot of hydrogen the clean way. Thank you. And Randolph, did you say what company you were in, uh, associated with? I, I'm the founder of New York, of Renewable New York, LLC. Uh, but don't don't be put off by the fact that it says New York. That's the, This company was started in the late 1990s, and uh, our, our practice is global, uh, with a special emphasis on uh, the continental United States. So uh, don't be put off by the fact that New York is in the title. Stick with the new part. And uh, don't feel c confined or constricted to the New York part. Got it. And do you mind if I ask you what your last name is, Randolph? It's Horner, H-O-R-N-E-R. -E Great. We won't ask you to put your contact info in the chat since you're on your well, phone. Well, um, I, I will tell you, this is easy because you're such an excellent administrator. Take Randolph with a P-H dot Horner, H-O-R-N-E-R, -E like little Jack Horner sat in the corner. At this is really easy, lowercase renewable. We all know what renewable energy is. Dash or hyphen NY, that's for New York, dot US. We know what that's for. So Randolph dot Horner at renewable dash NY dot US. Love to hear from you. Terrific. Thank you, Randolph. We appreciate having you on here. Um, I think I see a couple other new names. I'm, I won't call you out, but if you feel like introducing yourselves, we'd love to hear from you. Not new, but I just joined. Uh, sorry, I was late. I had to take my wife to the airport. So uh, looking forward to the discussion today. This is Mike Kraft with Alaska Environmental Power, Delta Wind Farm. Thank you, Mike. It's great to hear from you and great to have you with us. Anyone else? Hey, Aaron, this is Katie Conway. Um, I feel like I've been called out for sitting here for so long without introducing myself. I've been getting the emails for a while, but I don't often have an opportunity to, to listen in. And that's all. I've, if I've managed the energy program for the Denali Commission, and I'm just here to listen and learn from you all. Thank you. And Katie and Mike, please go ahead and put your contact info into the chat if you are so inclined. Is there anyone else who would like to identify themselves and say hi to everyone? Good morning. This is Audrey Alstrom. I'm the Director of Renewables um, and Energy Efficiency here at the Alaska Energy Authority. Welcome, Audrey. Always a pleasure to see you. Nice to see you too, Erin. Anyone else? We are up to 50 people on this call. This is terrific. What a party. Okay, I'm gonna let the awkward silent moment pass and we'll move on with our agenda. Welcome to everyone. Uh, this is our November monthly meeting um, and welcome to the new faces especially. And thanks to those of you who are brave enough to speak up. Um, we generally start with uh, We've had committee updates in the past. I wouldn't say those committees are particularly active uh, at the moment, but um, JR, is it okay if we skim over methanol for today or did you have anything earth shattering you wanted to report on that topic area for the group? Well, I think um, particularly since we've had Mitsubishi Power join us, um, Mitsubishi is one of the world 
leaders in this uh, area of methanol production. And if they're working on um, alternative fuel engines, this, that they may be a really uh, interesting people to talk to about what we're trying to do there. Um, but I, I don't know if we, we need to uh, uh, bog this down in the entire group. So maybe I should just give a quick summary and then maybe we can take it offline. I think that's great. Yep, let's do something in 20 or 30 seconds. How's that? Okay, so uh, and we do have a uh, subcommittee of this group that has been trying to figure out how we can get um, hydrogen carrier fuels, um, specifically methanol seems to be the, the opportunity right in front of us, although longer term it's going to be an impact, it, you know, hydrogen, ammonia, anything. We're running into a problem of trying to figure out how we can legally bring those engines um, into the U.S. and use them either as dual fuel options or as a, um, a engine conversion kits or just solely uh, running on these. We've actually been able to find engines that uh, exist and would be useful in Alaska, both uh, environmentally and um, in, in isolated areas, uh, some parts of the bush, they'd be very useful for power generation. On the North Slope, they'd be very useful compared to diesel and they'd be economically advantaged. So this is something where we could move to a, a cleaner um, footprint very, very quickly, if only we could figure out how to legally buy and sell uh, such engines. Um, so I, I didn't... Um, if if uh, is that something that Mitsubishi Power is interested in, or could we could get you plugged into? We definitely we always... like to hear more. Or go ahead, Ivan. I know you're on. I say we're definitely interested in hearing about it. Okay, well, uh, I'll I'll shoot you an email, and then maybe we can talk uh, separately. Okay. Thanks, Jr. And thanks to our Mitsubishi uh, visitors. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some exciting updates uh, at our next monthly meeting. Um, so that brings us to the main topic for today, which is reviewing the hydrogen opportunities report. And Patty Egan, our group coordinator, um, sent that out for review by the working group and any other interested members of the public uh, earlier this earlier in October. Um, we had a deadline of October 31st for written comments. Um, and Patty, I wonder if you might be able to share that file uh, in the chat, if that's at all possible um, for anyone who hasn't seen it. Um, what we'd like to do today is for those who submitted written comments, um, we've corresponded with them uh, individually and uh, asked them to summarize very briefly in just a couple of minutes, um, the high level themes of their comments uh, to the extent they're comfortable sharing. Um, so we're going to do that and then um, we'll open it up for any additional um, comments from the rest of the group after that uh, as, as part of our public process here. Um, the small group that's been working on the report, myself, uh, Masha Koleva, uh, Levi Kilcher and Jeff Ron are working through all the written comments right now. We wanna make sure we hear any additional comments today as well so that um, we have robust feedback on the report. And then we'll be turning that over and maybe we can have a final report by the time of the next monthly meeting. Uh, so that is the update on that process. Um, Patty, um, I would like to ask if you might call on the different people uh, who have submitted our written comments um, one by one. Can you help me with that, please? Yes, I can. And I will go ahead and put the list in the chat so everyone knows who's coming up. Um, but if it works or nobody has preference, I would say we could start off with Tim Leach from Launch Alaska. And thank you again to everyone who was reviewing it and especially provided those comments. This is definitely a group effort and everybody's been showing up. So thank you. Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Patty. Um, love uh, the opportunity to both uh, review uh, the writing, uh, the hard work that the the small team did on this, as well as the chance to provide some uh, some written comments and summarize the summarize those here. So thank you on that. Um, trying to summarize the many comments that we provided, that myself and Penny Gage, uh, my colleague, provided. I uh, wanted to call out a few. Uh, some of these might be in the form of a question, if that's a for, uh, permissible format, Aaron. Is that uh, 
is that allowed or should we should we save questions for emails for the for the writing team later ah uh, you can certainly ask questions i don't know if we'll have answers today but how's that <laughs> no worries i'll try to make those the easy ones then um <laughs> So yeah, for uh, for for jumping in on uh, page seventeen, uh, there was mention, and I really appreciate the team for including um, kind of a differentiator for why we in Alaska are are different, uh, or why why we have a very good opportunity for developing hydrogen power, uh, hydrogen uh, for for export especially. So I think that's just worth emphasizing, uh, and maybe part of this discussion here, and that's really the stranded renewable energy potential that we have. Uh, relative uh, the size and the production potential of our renewable energy relative to the demand that we have domestically, uh, giving us the opportunity for that oh, hydrogen yeah. production and then export. So yeah, I wanted to just call that out here briefly. Um, skipping a few pages forward onto pages 22 and 23, I really appreciated the uh, discussion of some of the use cases uh, for hydrogen. Um, I, think, I think it's worth um, bringing in for power production, um, the discussion of blending uh, hydrogen with with methane. Um, there's certainly some discussion uh, with Chugach Electric Association that we've been part part of um, or or participating in uh, of doing that as a demonstration uh, potentially locally with the Port of Alaska project, which is also called out in the report. Uh, and thank you for that. Um, definitely want to just underline that that conversation with the Port of Alaska for hydrogen yard trucks. Um, is underway, uh, and for the project team here, for the entire team here, you know that is one that I think is going to be seeking uh, federal funding in the form of grant support. Um, so, so worth calling that out as a you know relatively near term or maybe medium term uh, project opportunity for demonstration of hydrogen in yard trucks, and then also for power protect uh, power production with that blending. So, bringing in some blending language for uh, methane and hydrogen in power production. Uh, the question on page 23 on this in, is in relation to the medium and heavy duty uh, vehicles and the numbers uh, mentioned there. It talks about 5% of the transportation sector. So my question for, for the entity, the person who is writing that, uh, was if that squares up with what the most recent DEC greenhouse gas report mentions, which is uh, roughly 7% of transportation emissions. So I think that 5% isn't called out specifically uh, as to what what's that uh, what that is in relation to, uh, but the question is: Is that five percent of registration or registered vehicles, um, or if that is actually from the emissions? Does the author of that sentence have that in mind right now? If not, we can save that for an email follow up. I'm happy to answer. Okay. Uh, if if Erin thinks that it's it's appropriate for for a discussion right now, maybe a high level answer, and then you two yeah. can duke it out yeah. on email later. Yeah. Uh, so that that number was um pretty much uh, determined by the heavy duty vehicles that are currently um in Alaska, and uh, based on NROS analysis of uh how much what percentage is going to be converted to hydrogen. Uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles by 2030, uh, we came up with the 5%. So to answer the 5% is not the emissions, is the heavy duty vehicles percentage. Got it. So uh, of vehicles, it sounds like. Thank you. Correct. Yes. Appreciate it. Um, also on page 23, moving to SAF, um, you know, I, I think this one is, is one perhaps for conversation for the group. Um, I certainly have noted uh, a lot of conversation on on the global scene around the feedstock and that the shortage of feedstocks uh, for sustainable aviation fuels. Um, and I think we're in Alaska particularly challenged there with biogenic carbon. You know, we've got no shortage of carbon, right? Um, but I think if we're using fossil carbon, we're just kind of starting to do a bit of a chasing of our tail there, where we're trying to split things and then put them back together for uh, for e fuels in general or for SAF in particular. Um, so I think there's a Maybe an optimistic, uh, fairly high level discussion of SAF. And I, I think this is something that may be worth drilling into a little bit more as a group before we publish uh, that section anyway or finalize it. Um, my concern there is that we might paint too rosy of a picture uh, that would lead towards um, uh, you know, op optimistic rhetoric in the, in the legislature or otherwise, uh, which might not be aligned with our actual feedstocks or the availability of feedstocks. Uh, and, and really, I think the concern there is that other markets will have more and cheaper feedstocks for SAF than we will, so we won't be competitive. 
Yeah, this is a really good, really good point, Aaron. Um, uh, Tim, I, I'd like to ask you, when you attended that kind of World Staff Conference in Houston, um, what was the, the, the sort of the take on the biogenic carbon? Is pretty much the Europeans have adopted it as a standard? Is that the way it's going now? Uh, certainly, I'm no expert. I should mention that first. Um, but yeah, that was my take um, that there are um, uh, going to be standards that are that are looking at the carbon intensity um, of SAF. Um, and, and this comes to some of my other comments here in regards to, uh, you know, that that use uh, that the carbon intensity criteria. Um, and so, you know, fairly objective um, analysis there. So I think that is going to be something that we'll see in other markets, including the European Union, to yeah. answer your question there, Doug. And, and sorry, just uh, something I keyed in on as you were talking about that. I, I think that it's there's a little bit of a jump that we don't necessarily want to make between, you know, a low carbon footprint and biogenic, um, because, you know, when we think about, you know, say the natural gas and in Cook Inlet, I mean, that was biology that got smashed flat into car or coal and then an outgas and then it gets captured. I mean, the important thing is that if we're making SAF, that there's the lowest carbon footprint that we can get out of it. And that, um, you know, if we're combining that with some sort of a sequestration to make a blue uh, SAF, um, you know, that could be economically competitive where we wouldn't necessarily have a pulp mill to go uh, get something out of. So trying to craft it in such a way that we're emphasizing, you know, the the resources available without necessarily pegging ourselves to, you know, biogenic, um, anything that's clean should work. Uh, yeah, great points, JR. And, and I, um, you have more expertise on this area than I do. Um, so I would love a follow-up conversation <laughs> just to make sure I'm uh, in the training wheels version, are, am I on the right track here? But I think that low carbon intensity piece, at least in the conversation I was hearing down in Houston, um, was underpinned by biogenic sources or, or you know, using biogenic sources. So using a fossil carbon uh, input uh, was was kind of ending up uh, ending us up in like a chasing of our tails, you know, where we're taking something um, that is uh, steam methane reformation, where we're splitting it and and bringing it back together um, with overall uh, larger input there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, there's a big difference between a place like Texas where you've got a lot of, you know, feedlots and pulp mills and I mean, a lot of areas where you'd be able to get biogenic sources, but you don't have, um, well, Texas might be an exception, but there's there's a lot of places that don't have all of the carbon sequestration potential that um, Alaska uh, does. So uh, you don't end up chasing your tail necessarily here. It all depends on the energetics of what the carbon sequestration is. Okay. I see Masha's hand up as well. And then Nate, Nathan. Nate, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. And, and Tim, I'd be happy to talk, you know, a little bit more about, you know, some of, some of these things, but, you know, in general, you know, I think methanol is definitely a, a SAF opportunity. That's a feedstock for, for SAFs. And certainly Alaska has, uh, you know, carbon sources and good, uh, electrolysis potential. Uh, and then, you know, gathering materials is a challenge, but, you know, there are companies that uh, make uh, SAF and other fuels from, from fish waste as well. So I think that, you know, certainly, you know, more to look at, but, uh, you know, happy to to chat about that at, a you know, another time. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for calling out fish waste too. That might be a potential opportunity for us. Masha? Thanks, sir. Um, so, Tim, when uh, when you have this comment, do you want us in the report to discuss the different options, or do you want us to come with a number that is going to be corresponding to um, the SAF from hydrogen? Because that is going to involve a lot of uncertainty. So, um, just just if if you could if you could clarify what you would like to see in that section as expansion of discussion, or more numbers in there. Uh, at least from my perspective, I think, um, you know, maybe modifying the language a little bit uh, to suggest that there are, you know, different pathways to create SAF, different feedstocks, um, some of which, you know, we might have some opportunity in, uh, like Nathan, you were calling out if we're talking about fish waste um, or or JR, if you're talking about, um, you know, fossil carbon. Um, if there is, if there are, you know, some high level statements uh, around carbon intensity of, uh, you know, the pros and cons of some of the feedstocks that we do have available. You know, maybe those high level statements, if, if they're accurate at that general level, uh, could be included. 
Um, essentially, what I want to make sure is that we're not um, setting up a recommendation from our group that is taken by legislators and says, great, you know, all speed ahead if if we don't feel like that's uh, appropriate, at least with staff, because it sounds like, uh, and this again was my my impression from that uh, conference, the Sustainable Aviation Futures Congress down in Texas uh, in early October. It sounds like there are generally feedstock challenges globally. And then of those who I spoke with uh, specifically about Alaska, they, uh, and this this was including folks from Nesty, uh, who was the global leader in, in SAF production at this moment. Uh, they were saying that, you know, we were we were in a challenging position from a feedstocks perspective. Um, so I, if, you know, further research there is needed to make sure we have an accurate statement, happy to help with that. Um, but that was just something I wanted to flag out there. Okay. Okay. And and I like that, uh, Nathan, there. Awesome. Uh, so moving, moving on, because I know time is limited uh, from SAF. Um, Page 24, green corridors. I thought it might be helpful to call out some, some of the conversation there that Bill, I think, has mentioned uh, on this, this group's uh, calls in the past, the green corridor for cruise shipping, uh, you know, going from Pacific Northwest up to Juneau uh, or, other, or the other Southeast communities. Um, we touched on the carbon intensity piece a little bit already, but on page 24, I think it's worth um, considering some language or, or swapping of language from green, even though that's a, such a commonly used term uh, over to something that's a little bit more objective or potentially objective, which would be just talking about carbon intensity. Uh, and that certainly aligns with a lot of other languages out there in the policy arenas uh, globally. So I think that's um, potentially safe ground as well. Uh, page 29, um, you know, the state primacy for class six well injection. I, I have not looked at this um, so if the team has already, I'd love, you know, for further conversation, just kind of get your, um, you know, summary of the analysis there. But I think at least from from my perspective and from Penny, my colleague's perspective, we would want to do, Launch Alaska would want to do some some deeper research there on if that is indeed a, a, a sound recommendation that we could get behind. Um, you know, what, what are the pros and cons essentially of, of the argument there? Um, Tim, this, this... can I, can I, are you able to wrap up sort of the rest of your comments into some, some broad brushstrokes here, maybe then rather than itemizing every one of them, just so we can have, others can have time as well. Definitely. Yeah. And I've got just two more that are, okay. two more that are real quick. Um, so, uh, page 29, the PFD, um, you know, seemed like there's some some confusing language there in regards to the strengths using the strengths of the PFD. Um, but I think there could be something there, but at least as as written as I interpret it, um, not quite correct. Um, and then page 31 on the fuel standards, I think um, just aligning it with general language there around carbon intensity. Uh, if we're talking about aligning fuel standards with low carbon intensity rather than being technology or fuel specific, and I think that follows the best practice in policy making if we're talking about something like a CAFE standard and unlike an ethanol specific, you know, pick, picking a winner type of a, a policy approach there. So those are kind of the high level comments, uh, lots of other ones that are more on readability stuff. I'd like to just briefly respond to the, uh, the class six wells. So that's that's what would allow Alaska to develop a regulatory regime, which would uh, allow for carbon sequestration. Um, it, you'll find that most of the geological expertise sits not at the federal, but the state level, for instance, like the Alaska Oil and Gas Conservation Commission is a, a state agency. So we, the uh, federal government tends to have a lot less um, uh, knowledge and, and scientific depth in this area. So if we're actually going to do it well, it should be something that, that comes from the uh, existing organizations that we have that understand Alaska's geology well. Thanks, okay. Great. Okay. Sorry. Everything's okay on this end, despite the beeping sounds you hear. All right. We thank you very much, Tim. Appreciate those comments. We've got a, a half a dozen other folks to get through. So again, we're going to ask folks to try to limit it to the broad highlights. I, I know that many of the comments were very nuanced and detailed. Um, Patty, who is up next? Thanks. We have um, Doug Johnson from ORPC. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I really want to congratulate and thank the, the team that wrote this document. I think it's a great start. Um, creates a wonderful framework for conversation like we're having now, which I think we need a lot more of. Um, so I, I, I have a number of comments meant like Tim did, but I'm not going to get into all the detail of it. I think what 
what for me is is important in overall is that we continue to look at sort of the the economic aspects of this and make sure we do our best to ground truth those economic uh, considerations because I I find that it, as a developer as we're working as we're this summer we we were planning to be splashing our first turbine in Cook Inlet and as we as we develop our Cook Inlet Tidal Energy Project for us and working with our customers it's really important that we're working with with real information and I'm concerned that that you know as we do these these kind of group efforts that we, we generalize things to be able to get something done. And uh, which is important, I, I, I think this report has tremendous value, but to the degree that we can get more certainty around the numbers, I would really incorporate, uh, encourage that and, and look to see how do we take more time to be able to do that? Because I know we're all very uh, busy people trying to get a lot done. So that would be one of my comments. Another thing for me in this that, that, that came to light after I read the report and looked through it is that if we're gonna be successful, I believe in, in really taking advantage of all the re renewable opportunities we have in the, the Cook Inlet region uh, around this uh, transition, we're gonna to have to have a, just massive cooperation between everybody in the ecosystem um, is what it's gonna take. Um, I'm currently talking to, to, to several companies that are interested in coming to Alaska. They're looking for two things. They want low carbon electricity and they want it at a sub 10 cent price point. And um, the key thing here is, you know, the only way that's gonna, that I can see that happening is, is again, massive cooperation of, of everybody in the ecosystem. And I think that this, this uh, document really creates the framework to, to help us with that, to how, how can we create that, that cooperation and that collaboration that's gonna need to take place to be successful. Um, and that's really kind of the essence of, of my comments at the moment. There were a lot of specific things that I looked at. I'm happy to talk with any of the reviewers about you know those. And I had a couple of questions, but I'll let some other folks talk. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Doug. And I noted some of your comments, you know, where does this number come from and things like that. Um, we we are digging into those comments one by one. Um, I appreciate your comments about the cooperation and collaboration that's needed. Uh, it seems to me maybe we need to to say more about uh, that, but uh, I'm still thinking about sort of how we might express that. So if you have any thoughts um, there, um, feel free to chime in offline or, or separately, individually, so. Thank you, Doug. Oh. Next up, we have Matt Bergen from Kotzebue Electric Association. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Um, so let me find what I sent you, Patty because it's been a couple sleeps. Um, essentially, it's kind of our, our rural perspective that I'm coming from, but we are definitely keen on um, using hydrogen out here for essentially long duration energy storage, um, overproducing power from either winter storms or summer sun and storing it for periods when there are no either wind or solar resources and our batteries are depleted. So essentially seasonal energy storage and displacement. Um, so yeah, I've, I've really found the, uh, the chart on page 13 super informative. You can see from a statewide perspective, the majority of our energy needs are for thermal, for heating. You can see how electrical is uh, pretty small compared to heating. And that really shows up here in rural Alaska in terms of the cost of living is mostly associated with heating a home rather than electrifying a home. Um, so yeah, um, the page 13 diagram is great. Um, definitely I like the commentary on trying to reform the PCE program to accommodate renewables and especially uh, potential hydrogen production and use down the road. Uh, page 36, PCE is definitely not a subsidy. Uh, it is a program as much as the big hydroelectric dam by Homer is not a subsidy. I don't think we call it that, do we? So um, yeah, there needs to be some, some recognition of what PCE is on the big scheme of things. And then in, uh, on page 38 for next steps, I think demonstrating the use of hydrogen in rural Alaska for electricity, of course, but also to try to um, alleviate the cost of heating a home for heating a home and making hot water or even cooking with hydrogen. Um, 
the uh, the cost of stove oil of propane in rural Alaska is uh, outrageous. You know, some villages, if they have it, sometimes they run out. It's, you know, $12, $14. Here in Cotsview, we're at $8 a gallon. So, um, yeah, heating, domestic hot water is at the huge cost, and we're hoping to use hydrogen for that as well as electricity. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. It's so great to have these perspectives from around the state. Uh, just so valuable. Really appreciate you tuning in today. Patty, who's up next? David Clark from Alaska Marine Power. Uh, thanks, Aaron. I'm David Clark, the engineering director with uh, Alaska Marine Power. Overall, I find the report is a very good summation of the hydrogen, operate, uh, hydrogen opportunities in the state and really demonstrates the huge potential to regenerate Alaska's economy. But it'll be a huge challenge, um, potentially comparable in terms of scale and cost to oil and gas developments in the 60s and the 70s on the Ingham Cook Inlet and also on the, on the North Slope. I had many uh, editorial comments, but I uh, won't go into those. But I think the one thing that the report could benefit from is a, a schematic that pulls it all together. Um, Patty, can I share my screen and I can maybe talk you through it? Yes, you should be able to. Okay, can people see that? Yes, yes. that's good. Okay, so this is what we call a stick diagram. When I worked in oil and gas in major projects, we generally pulled one of these together at the beginning of the project. What we found was that people generally didn't understand what was in and out of scope and how it had related to other, um, other aspects and other components. So this is my first pass at putting this together. Um, I'm not a graphic artist, but basically what it does is it shows on the, the left hand side, you'll see there's onshore uh, renewable uh, power um, uh, uh, um, systems and, um, and also what, there's offshore. The reason I've divided those up is that the onshore ones tend to be smaller in the terms of tens to hundreds of megawatts and relatively near term. They're either in production or they can be put in production within this decade. Offshore, they tend to be larger, uh, hundreds to gigawatts scale, but a much longer timeline. You're looking at the early 2030s uh, to mid 2030s. So different in terms of scale and also in, in timeline. But the, um, and also on where they would, uh, where they would tie into the grid. And the, the recent announcement of the $200 million grant from the DOE to uh, upgrade or to put a HVDC line between Nikiski and um, Beluga will actually allow us to wheel uh, renewable power to where it's needed. So that's a really, really positive development. Inside the, uh, the yellow, uh, that's basically what I'm assuming is in the scope of uh, this uh, workshop. So basically you've got the power coming in, obviously electrolyzers uh, is a key element to produce hydrogen. And then on the right, you've got all of the, um, the end users that are mentioned in the report from spiking into the natural grid, uh, above ground storage, supplying uh, hustlers at the, at the port and uh, other transportation uses. And then you've got uh, ammonia production for export and then uh, e-fuels. The big thing about e-fuels is you do need a source of carbon, which was mentioned earlier. Um, most like, or the most suitable source would be CO2. So I'm assuming that also in the scope would be how we could get that CO2. So I see three main options. There's direct air capture, and we know that uh, ASRC are looking at that uh, in Alaska. They got a DOE grant for that. There's also Captura, who are looking at direct ocean capture, where you actually uh, remove the CO2 from the... Um, from ocean water. And then there's uh, this governor's talking about CO2 imports. So those are three potential sources for carbon that would supply um, fuels plants. Um, most of the renewables, uh, with the exception of um, hydro and to some extent uh, and geothermal are inter intermittent. So we really need to be able to supply uh, feedstocks to chemical plants 24-7, 365 days a year. So actually a key enabling technology for e-fuels will be the ability to store hydrogen and CO2. And the only practical way to do that is really in depleted oil and gas reservoirs. So this sort of, sort of shows how everything sort of fits together. And then the bubbles around the outside 
are really uh, taken from tables two to seven in uh, in section nine, and those are really the thing the the way forward the um the uh the, the basically the, the the future work program, and what we really need to do is be able to identify who's responsible for moving those forward and really how they're going to be funded. So I say this is just my impression. Um, I'm sure there's lots of things that could be added to this, um, but I thought it would help to sort of provide a roadmap for the for the report. Thank you, David. Um, we appreciate the artistic efforts. I'm not uh, an artist. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, complete with little icons and everything. For someone who's not a graphic artist, you've done a admirable first pass at this. Um, so we, you know, this this pretty much sums up the report, right? <laughs> yes, I think they was hoping to tie it all together and uh, and again also sort of say that what's in and out of scope. Yeah, yeah it's important to clarify. I mean, I, I think you did an awesome job on this. I, I, if we were actually going to put this in here, though, I think we would want to put um, blue generation of hydrogen also would, and then uh, some something about hydrogen carrier fuels. OK. And the other thing that's maybe missing is uh, biomass. I, I didn't put it in, but that could also be a source of carbon as opposed to CO two. David, when, did you when you looked at that that uh, component on your BES and your PSH, wh what are you looking there at? Anything specific? A storage mediums? That would be um, th those are being considered uh, for the rail belt grid, but I assume that those will be outside the scope of hydrogen. Those are really um, to sort of smaller scale to um, satisfy existing customers on the on the rail belt. Do you do you think there's going to, in terms of production of hydrogen, though, like you pointed out with the renewables and the intermittency, are we going to need some sort of storage capacity to be able to, to work with that? Yeah, I think the you're talking about e-fuels, you're really talking at least uh, one and a half to three gigawatts of power to provide a... Uh, uh, enough hydrogen for a typical um, world scale e fuels plant. Uh, it would really be impractical to store that amount of electrical power with batteries or uh, pump storage. So that's really why sort of looking at storing hydrogen as the inter intermediate product. And uh, with, with uh, subsurface storage, really the cost of storing storage is really independent of the volume. You just pick a bigger reservoir. So we can actually store hydrogen and CO2 for not just between weather systems, but between uh, seasonally as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Michael, were you hoping to say something? I saw your box light up. No, okay. Um. Okay. That's Thank great. You. Appreciate that. Patty, go ahead. Who's our next person? Thanks, David. Um, so we're gonna ask Bob Seitz from Architect Engineering. Yeah, I, as I said before, I've been chasing hydrogen in Alaska since 1980, and I'm still still waiting for it, but I think uh, we're closer than we've ever been. My main comment was that we didn't focus, or this report didn't focus on the um, application of hydrogen energy storage in the villages, or the, the remote communities. And that's what my interest has been all this time. And and I even suggested in my comment that I think we're at a point now that we need some kind of demonstration project for electrolysis of hydrogen and then whatever conversion we might be able to do in the remote communities to methanol or whatever else it would be the effective storage. But that that's my primary interest is trying to get this energy storage into the communities that are already uh, adapting to the wind and solar and other energies is and as uh, Matthew discussed from Kotzebue that you know they have you know he's seeing a need for looking at this for their heat and electrical generation. I've been trying to get information from the electrolyzer manufacturers for years, but nobody wants to talk to me if I don't have a project to identify uh, of what we're doing. Um, but I, I think I think it would be appropriate 
that some kind of demonstration project with a small electrolyzer and try to get the details worked out for how a community might uh, be able to incorporate these into their system and, and different communities will have different mechanisms that they have to deal with. But I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to work out the whatever, a basic design for an electrolysis system for a small community. And I went back to uh, the MTU U Rolls Royce event with Mike Whittem last month uh, just to see Electrolyzer, and they didn't have theirs with them. So uh, we're still working on that. That's all I got for now. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate if, that. If, yeah, if Mitsubishi's got information that they want to send me, I'd appreciate it. All right. Great. Yeah. I'm with you. I'd love to see a, a demonstration project. Um, appreciate that uh, emphasis on that point. Um, Patty, who's next? J.R. Wilcox from Alyeskin. Okay, well, I, I'm not sure how much of this we really need to read. I, there were some just generally, um, you know, a lot of my expertise, you know, is more from the uh, fossil fuels background um, and from, uh, you know, uh, methanol uh, generation in particular. Um, so I, I tried to offer what uh, insight I could onto those sections. I did think it was, we, we could probably build out a little bit about the importance of why we want to use hydrogen carriers at all. Uh, it, it appeared that the definition of clean hydrogen was really focused in on the carbon emissions at the, the point of use, which I thought was a, a little illusory because, you know, you can spend an enormous amount of energy and carbon footprint generating a machine, which, you know, creates a carbon free fuel, which can then take an enormous amount of energy and carbon to transport. But if it was you know, clean when you burned it, despite having a huge environmental footprint, it would have counted as clean under that definition. So that's where I felt like building out at least um, a, a little bit of comment that the 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 life cycle um, footprint needs to be examined uh, and, and transportation of that uh, uh, matters. And so, you know, that that's why, you know, there's some energy losses during the conversion process, but if they're offset by um, making the transportation more efficient, uh, then it's worth looking at things like methanol and ammonia and other or other kinds of uh, hydrogen carriers. Uh, uh, again, the uh, put in some more description of methanol opportunities there, and built out just a little bit of statement about what we're we were trying to do, you know, in this group and in terms of figuring out the regulatory hurdles keeping us from adopting engines that could use hydrogen carrier hydro, well hydrogen and hydrogen carrier fuels. Okay. Uh, so, but yeah, kind of stemming back in the comments, I guess uh, we, we've already, uh, you know, uh, heard the, the, it's the, we do want to emphasize, uh, you know, sometimes some of the language steers us towards wanting to say e-methanol or green methanol or some of these other things where really what we want to focus on is the lowest environmental footprint of uh, energy that we can deliver agnostic of whether that that is some sort of a it's derived from um, you know a, a green energy or uh, fossil fuels with carbon capture. Uh, the important thing is just ensuring that we have the um, the best uh, and lightest footprint we have at the end of the uh, by the time that energy is finally from gen cradle to grave the the lowest uh, footprint. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that, JR. Um, Patty, do we have another person in the queue? I think we're gonna open it up now. Um, we do have one more review from Mark Malena um, and he's from DOE. Um, Masha, I know that he might join later, but so we can make space for, for that when uh, joined, but for now we can probably open it up. Yeah, okay, so Masha, please let us know when and if Mark joins, I don't see him on the call currently. Um, but yeah, so thanks to all of those who submitted written comments by the Halloween deadline. We've just given them some space to uh, you know, share their comments with all of you. Um, but now we have a chance for anyone who's on the call here uh, who perhaps didn't submit written comments. Um, we'd love to hear any comments 
thoughts, feedback, um, broad themes um, are preferable. Uh, and of course, if you have some detailed suggestions, suggest that you send those to Patty Egan uh, immediately after this meeting. Um, and Patty uh, can put her email in the chat one more time if that's needed. Uh, but you can also message her here in the chat. So are there any general comments on the report? And again, we just want to allow for the most um, input possible here. No impromptu thoughts or comments. Uh, I, I was just going to say, I, I agree that I think it's a great, you know, starting framework and just wondering, you know, if we have any thoughts about, you know, when we're approaching sort of a, you know, a final, uh, you know, iteration of of this, if, if you have any ideas on that timeline. Well, I will say my personal preference is to see something, um, you know, by the end of the year here, uh, as we go through the comments, we'll I mean, we're going to work as hard as we can to, to resolve this and follow up with folks. Um, I think I'll just leave it at that for now. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Jesse, did I see you trying to get a word in there? Yeah, um, my, my thoughts are around what Bob said about the potential of a pilot project and it was also kind of around timeline. Like let's let's just say that that was an opportunity how readily available would everything be that 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 a pilot project could be put together how difficult would that be is it you know i think it depends on uh the type of project that we're envisioning um well, as you saw uh, from Bob's a stick point, diagram there there's everything from rural applications to staff production to lots of different things well, to uh, Bob's idea that he kind of painted in my head when he was talking, um, I was thinking of it as a village, Alaskan village pilot project, like a single demonstration. How difficult would that really be? I, I don't know, uh, you know. Um, is, I, mean, is I think it depends things... on what you're trying to demonstrate. Yeah, yeah and uh, just to speak on that, I think that for, you know, a village project, if you line up with the funding opportunity, you know, certainly for an electrolyzer project, you know, within two years, that's a project that could be, you know, an operation. Just looking at examples like uh, the Denim Hydrogen Project in Australia. Uh, so, you know, uh, and obviously for for sustainable aviation, you know, those are more on, you know, uh, project time scales, you know, three or or five years or even longer than that. Okay. Um, I see hands up from Michael and then uh, Michael with them and then another Michael, Mike Kraft after that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I think Nathan kind of summed it up, I, I think within a couple of years. Um, so, um, I'm Mike with them. I'm the Alaska Sales Manager for Pacific Power Group. We uh, represent uh, MT Rolls Royce traditional uh, reciprocating engine generators, gaseous and diesel fueled, and dynamic UPS systems, best systems, and they're also getting involved in hydrogen. So, um, as Bob had mentioned, and, and I've talked to him at length, and, and what he's really trying to achieve here is having a, a real world. Uh, demonstration project with an electrolyzer in a remote community that's that's supplied power by excess renewables essentially and whether that is used as a hundred percent hydrogen fuel gas as a gaseous fuel or converted into a hydrogen carrier fuel such as methanol that would be the other step but i, I think we have all these manufacturers all around the world that are you know they're they're hustling to develop Develop the technology and get it out there as soon as possible. So I, I think for a demonstration project, it's much more viable than having something that's commercially available. And I've talked at length with MT Rolls Royce and, and um, you know, planted the seed in their mind, you know, as to, you know, if you have a, 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 a prototype, a demonstration project would be perfect uh, for Alaska. They've already done a few of these projects like uh, uh, Dewis, uh 
Interport 2 project in Germany, which is a, a hydrogen microgrid uh, at the port of Duisburg in Germany. And so that's that's a project that Rolls-Royce has been heavily involved in. And I've been talking to some of the people that have been involved in that specific project and and really kind of trying to entice them to get involved in this, this Alaska Hydrogen Working Group because of what we've got going on. So um, it's all about, you know, putting the, the screws to them and, and showing them that we're serious. But I mean, j this is just one specific manufacturer. And obviously, you know, there's a plethora of different manufacturers. But I do think within a couple of years that that a demonstration project could um, be completed as far as having the equipment available. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mike Kraft. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm just curious, is it possible that, that we should be also making information available with respect to electrolyzers and what the, what the current kind of top shelf technology is, the efficiency of it, the lifespan of it. That's one of the issues I'm running into in the private sector is really identifying what kind of electrolyzer I should be thinking about using either at the wind farm or some other projects we're working on. And I'm just curious if that might not speed things along if there is a bunch of information like a, a database, for example, of current technology and, and the availability of that technology and maybe the, uh, the the good and bad about specific technology that's being out there. So just wanted to raise that. I appreciate that, Mike. And um, that might be something that uh, we could work on for you. Um, I'll, I can follow up with you maybe separately about that. Um, I'm gonna go to Matt Bergen next. He's gonna he's gonna wave his flag and tell everyone to come to Kotsimu and install a hydrogen system, right, Matt? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, in terms of that's what we've been wanting to do is demonstrate essentially a pilot project. We do have excess renewables at time, and we're working on getting even more excess renewables. AVEC has some communities with quite a bit of excess renewable power, but yeah, we want, we'd like to sort of get our feet wet with a, you know, like a 500 kW scale, 250 to 500 kW scale system um, with a little bit of hydrogen storage in the middle that we can, um, you know, see what it's like. And it seems like at that scale, there's quite a few manufacturers out there that are making equipment, uh, whether it's electrolyzers, storage tanks, and then fuel cells. I, I say fuel cells because um, seems like any time we deal with diesel engines, the DEC air quality people get involved and it turns into a huge, huge deal. So I think just um, putting the hydrogen into a fuel cell be more straightforward than dealing with air permit issues, unless we go to 100% hydrogen internal combustion engine. So, yeah, I think the parts are out there. We've got some excess renewables to try it, but I think that's what it's going to take is um, pilot projects out there at small scale than large scale to really um, move the needle on this. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Uh, James Stevens. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Stevens. I'm the tribal administrator for the native village of Atka. We do have uh, excess hydroelectric pow power here in the community, and we are currently pursuing uh, an electrolyzer project. Uh, we have the funding pretty much in line to do an installation, to purchase an install. But uh, in the next week or two, we are inspecting one manufacturer of the equipment. Uh, and we're seeking, I'd like to know if there's, who else is out there that is responsive to rural Alaska scenarios. You know, we're a small village. We've got uh, probably 150 kilowatts of excess power consumption. And we'd like to see how much uh, hydrogen fuel that we can generate to replace diesel, to heat our homes and power our small engines at this time. Are you asking for specific feedback on electrolyzers or feedback or help sort of modeling the entire system, Jim? Uh, mostly, well, I'd take help either way. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, 
I know you and I have talked and I, I, I have maybe some more connections I can make for you after this meeting. So I, mm -hmm. I will follow up with you as well. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Matt Bergen, did you want to say more or did you just still have your hand up? Nope. Forgot to lower my hand. Okay. Daryl Brown. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Very good. So I work for the Department of Energy Mineral Development uh, of the BIA. Uh, Do you mean Department of Interior? Well, okay, yeah, exactly. Department of Interior. Thank you. Department of Indian Affairs, Division of Energy and Mineral Development. And we sponsor two grants. And we'll have a grant that comes out here in the near future. Um, and it's a competitive grant program where we can, uh, if a Alaska Native village uh, applies, and they can apply for money to fund a feasibility study, and it might apply to one of your pilot projects. Um, so we do fund, uh, we have funded several projects up in Alaska and, and currently are working with several villages, not necessarily with electrolyzers, but it could be. And so uh, if you uh, keep your eyes open for the solicitation that will be coming out, hopefully in the near future. Thank you. Do you have the name of that grant or a number that we can look for or search on after it comes out? No, I don't have any of that information other than it'd be on grants.gov and that it would be under the BIA DEMD. -E okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. All right. Um, other comments about the hydrogen opportunities report from anyone on the call? Anyone, anyone. May I speak up again from New York? Yes, please, Randolph, go ahead. When earlier I generalized about the failure as, as a longstanding solar developer, the failure of solar and wind to even approach a fraction of the generation required to meet our decarbonization and energy assurance goals and commitments, I understand full well what's also been described here, where at village scale, there might be some spilled power or some uh, uncommitted generation. So I, I, in my generalizing a terawatt scale, a 1000 gigawatt scale situation, I, I didn't mean in any way to say that I'm the guru and I'm the expert and brush aside the fact that at village scale, there, there, there is some spilled um, or, or curtailed uh, generation, either from solar or wind or hydroelectric. So I, I just want to insert that clarification. We're working with very, very large solutions to immense uh, national and global problems. And I didn't want to be misunderstood when I made that generalization. Thank you for the chance to come back on. Thank you, Randolph. We appreciate your comments. Are there other comments about either this discussion or the opportunities report? And I appreciate the the chatter in the in the chat box as well. It's Scott Neumeister with Mitsubishi. Just um, wanted to understand the um, the purpose of the the paper. Is is that just you know collecting information and and uh, you know trying to chart out a, a roadmap, or, or is there a, a broader objective for that or a next step? Well, so I think there's a couple parts to that question, and I would invite the other authors to chime in as well. Um, we're being careful not to call it a roadmap because a roadmap, at least amongst our author group, implies you know a, a specific direction. And as we were putting this together, it became clear to us that there were a lot of different pathways for Alaska, and so we decided to name it an opportunities report instead because. We're not saying we're going to do this in the next five years and this in the next 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think a next step might be an actual roadmap. 
but it was clear to us as we were putting this information together that we needed to set the stage um, with a description of the opportunities within the state. Um, as for uh, sort of the inspiration for the report or the purpose of the report, um, you may recall that the Department of Energy came out with a national roadmap for hydrogen. Uh, I believe it was finalized earlier this year. Um, and there's very little mention, if any, of Alaska. And uh, I think that this report is a way of putting Alaska on the map um, with regard to hydrogen possibilities and, and a future hydrogen economy uh, in a way that has not been treated, it has not been treated um, in the national conversation. So uh, I hope that answers at least part of your question there, Scott. Yes, it does. That That's helpful. Okay. And um, Masha, Levi, or Jeff, did you want to add anything to that? I think that was good. I, I would just, yeah, I don't have anything to add, except I would emphasize the point that, you know, it's about establishing a foundation and sort of like, hopefully we can all agree on, um, the facts and the opportunities, the re sort of the resource opportunities and um, infrastructure requirements that would be needed for all for a lot of the different options that are on the table, so that it's the again it's the foundation for a conversation about what should happen next. Thank you, Levi. Okay, we've got about 15 or 20 minutes left until the top of the hour. Any other comments on the report? I hope it's widely read. Just some light bedtime reading. Um, so once again, thanks to everyone who sent in written comments. Thanks to everyone who has provided comments today. Um, I think we'll close the report comments here. We also, we generally try to wrap these meetings up with any uh, roundtable announcements about fun hydrogen projects, opportunities, or developments in the state. Is there anything that anyone would like to share about uh, anything they're undertaking relative to hydrogen in the state? Aaron, I can jump in with uh, just a quick follow up on what I just chatted about there in regards to the Port of Alaska project. Uh, the Port of Alaska, is, as I'm sure most of you know, is located in Anchorage, Alaska, so it does not uh, quite connect with the idea of a rural uh, demonstration project, uh, although, of course, there are some implications of, of the goods that come across the port stock uh, for rural Alaska. Uh, what the Port of Alaska, though, is interested in doing um, is kind of uh, a two-stage demonstration project, one that would be qualified as this light and fast approach really focused on two hydrogen fuel uh, cell yard trucks. Uh, these are the the vehicles, of course, that move the containers off the off the uh, vessels and then around the port itself. Um, those yard trucks that are being targeted are actually in existence uh, down at the port of Long Beach uh, from an earlier demonstration project. They're not currently being used, so that might allow us to move more quickly uh, towards a limited scale demonstration project if we're just talking about the yard truck application uh, with refueling in infrastructure and imported hydrogen. Uh, with also some limited on-site uh, hydrogen storage for you know some amount of of days days or duty cycles. Uh, the second version is a larger scale uh, project, which includes uh, those yard trucks and the infrastructure that I just mentioned, uh, but also includes hydrogen electrolysis either on the port grounds or or nearby uh, for some some regional production of hydrogen, uh, preferably of course with renewable energy as as the main source behind that, uh, so that can be demonstrated. Uh, and Shigatch is interested in, in assisting with that. Um, also, the other piece of that would be use of hydrogen in the blended power, uh, sorry, the blended um, uh, feedstock for power production. So, you know, blending methane and hydrogen uh, potentially in one of the turbines that is currently uh, at the um, site right down in uh, Ship Creek area, so very close to the port. Uh, so there's some discussion of that and what it would take to reconfigure um, that actual turbine to allow for that blended fuel. So there's some, some interest in demonstrating, you know, what that takes uh, to then say, is this gonna be an effective approach for some of the existing uh, power generation units uh, in other locations? 
So those are um, the two types of scopes. Um, and, and that latter scope, the bigger one is, you know, obviously going to be or, or likely uh, going to be on a longer time scale uh, and really dependent heavily on grants. Uh, the one grant that seems to be the best fit um, is likely going to be the EPA Clean Ports Program. And that solicitation is expected to be issued in late winter of 2024. I think the, the agencies uh, suggested that might be the end of February. So we'll be looking at that uh, when it comes out for more spe uh, specifics to make sure there is indeed alignment with what, what the project team likes would like to do. Um, and then the other piece of it, um, if if you are interested, feel free to follow up with me. There are, there are a number of parties that are involved in the discussion uh, to support the Port of Alaska, um, several of the national labs, uh, NREL, Sandia, and Pacific Northwest National Labs in particular, um, and then ORPC, uh, and then Zero Avia. And you say, Zero Avia, if you, if you know that, they're actually an aviation company. Um, so why are they involved in the discussion? They're thinking about this as potential demonstration and development of regional infrastructure that could eventually also support uh, hydrogen aviation use cases and demonstrations over at the Ted Stevens Anchorage International, for example. Um, so those are a few parties that are involved. Um, uh, HTI Energy, I should have mentioned them as well. Um, and of course, Port of Alaska itself is, is the main actor there. Great. So, Thank you for the, for the very comprehensive overview, Tim. Um, I've also had a request from Masha to share about some activities at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Masha, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erin. So I just want to say about um, actually a demonstration project that is going to happen here at NREL um, is going to be uh, spanning in 2024 and 2025. Uh, and we're going to be leveraging our assets, uh, the Flatirons campus, which are one 1.25 uh, PEM electrolyzer, 600 kilograms of uh, hydrogen compressed storage, 520 kilograms of material-based hydrogen, um, PEM uh, fuel cell, and 100% uh, hydrogen uh, genset. Uh, and uh, we're going to pair those with uh, renewables on site with our grid simulator uh, to be able to provide uh, electricity for, um, for various loads. We partner with why I'm actually talking about this. We partner with a lot of folks from Alaska. We partner with the Port of Alaska on this project. We partner um, with um, Chugach Electric, with Matanuska Electric Association, uh, with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, and we hope we build those partnerships. The demonstration is not happening in Alaska. The demonstration is happening at Enro. However, um, the, the, the insights from the demonstration are going to be able to inform our partners in Alaska. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to reach out. Thanks. Masha, do you have partners from all over the nation for this deployment? I Pretty assume it's much. not just, okay, it's not Pretty much, just yeah. Alaska not, project. Not just, yeah, yeah, not just Alaska. We have other partners as well, but um, there are, there is a quite good representation from Alaska. Okay, great. Appreciate that update. Um, any other updates on hydrogen developments in the state from anyone? May I make one more comment from the other side of the lower 48 that I could think could be instructive, especially having just heard the report about the Port of Alaska? Go ahead, Mr. New York. Well, I, I just want you to know that in the so-called hydrogen hubs project, it is perfectly true that the Pacific Northwest hub was designated as one of the awardees. It is also true that there was discussion about green corridor from that hub all the way up to Juneau for, for potentially decarbonizing uh, the cruise ships, which are so importantly, in and out of Juno. That's a reality. The other reality I wanted to state is that the iteration, the elaboration, the execution of the Hydrogen Hubs project is very slow spooling up. Uh, as anybody who's associated with any of those hubs will know, uh, early on, there'll be another planning exercise with a trivial amount of funding. So to the extent that there is a vision in Alaska 
and a starting point for scaling to uh, many megawatts or hundreds of megawatts could begin at the port of Alaska with the intention to scale across the rail belt and the interior, as well as serving uh, the, the native Alaskan villages in a, at a different scale and in a different way, you can actually get the jump on the hydrogen hubs, and I would be glad to help with that, given the extent to which the NREL and Port of Alaska project already exists. And that's not taking anything away from any of the designated or awarded hydrogen hubs projects. It's just that there's not going to be a lot of DOE funding in the early stage as it has been explained. And I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I think I understand where things stand right now. So there was earlier an expressed intention to link up uh, the Pacific Northwest hub with a green Carter approach to Alaska. And there, there may be a, a, a way to drive commercial capitalization and investment in, into scaling um, to the benefit of Alaska as a test bed. Uh, I would wholeheartedly recommend it. And uh, Aaron, if you want to get in touch with me, I'll tell you how. Okay, thank you. I think what I'm also hearing you say, Randolph, is just do it. Um, well, well, there's a there's many a slip twixt the cup and the lip, and and the answer is to create a commercial off taker reality that is scalable, and then investment capital given the available incentives apart from the hydrogen hubs uh, awards, apart from those awards, all the rest of the potential uh, speed to market opportunity. Uh, certainly, uh, I, I see here, looking up at you from the other side of the lower 48, I see a very vigorous and well-populated community of interest. And so uh, perhaps I could have some offline conversation with you about how to drive significant private and investment capital and not just be hanging around for grants. Thank you, Randolph. We'll follow up with you, and we appreciate your enthusiasm and support. I say all all good wishes and cheers to the progress you've made already in, in aligning uh, a, a, an across the state of Alaska intention. So I, I'm very, very proud to have listened in. Thank you. Any other comments uh, or updates about hydrogen developments in the state? JR, I see your hand up. Quick comment, just there was a, a lot of back and forth from um, on, on rural development and deployment. And I just wanted to note that was one of the reasons why we started working on these hydrogen carrier engine things to begin with is, is that's uh, probably a quick way with readily deployable technology to start um, transitioning away uh, from fossil fuels uh, in, in rural uh, settings uh, without having to do too much science between them and now. Thank you, JR. Aaron, I was just going to say, uh, A, commend uh, David for his uh, graphic design skills. Um, I was very impressed with that graphic. And I think one of the things that if my one comment on the report is just trying to find the, the synergies between different industries and where you can basically share capital and infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I say a lot of times that, you know, if you don't have extremely deep renewable penetration, Sometimes the most efficient use of that renewable electron is to basically just use it in electrification and in the grid. But, you know, how to basically balance that to basically use hydrogen where it makes sense. And um, a lot of times we do like economic alternative analysis, looking at like if your objective is X, like what are the different things you can do to most cost effectively achieve that? But that ecosystem that that David was was highlighting that's where I see it with a lot of the hydrogen hubs is is getting paired with different industries. And um, I, I think that there's a lot to what he's got in there. Um, and then the the other thing I, I'd say, you know, under so many NDAs, um, so I'm trying to speak without violating any of them. Um, <clears throat> I think there's going to be a huge amount of potential to replicate some solutions and designs, particularly in the Alaska villages. In some of these smaller communities, um, and I, I think there's going to be some exciting, and, and and that will be the purpose of a lot of this DOE funding, right? Is to bring to daylight some designs, use cases, solutions, um, 
And I, I know that there, there's great thing to get the DLE money, but there's also you're going at the pace and there is a overhead and a burden. And I know you work for the DOE, so, <laughs> um, but sometimes that administration cost of extending your project, some folks have been glad that they haven't been selected because they can run faster now and not uh, have that extra administration burden by the extended timelines. And I think Thank Alaska has that opportunity now. Thank you, Justin. I hear your comments. Uh well taken points, all of them. Uh, even though I'm DOE, I'm also an Alaskan. Uh, I've worked in a lot of different sectors, so I do understand the difficulties. Um, I appreciate your insights. Uh, Mike Kraft, I think this might be our last comment here. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to point out, you know, the concept of overcapacity. When you're designing these projects, you know, obviously, just like uh, Justin just said, you know, we're, we're really using every bit of the sub 10 cent power we can buy right now. I mean, so if we're building projects, they're gonna get us into this hydrogen economy. We've got to start thinking about where that energy to produce that hydrogen is gonna come from. In addition to what we're doing right now, the footprint we already have, how are we reducing that? So, you know, like even on these wind projects, you know, in Cotterby and Nome, where they've got four or 500 kilowatts of excess power time to time, uh, because they're spilling it, uh, you know, that's that's over capacity. And that's that's where this hydrogen is going to come from. Because if you're building projects and you're putting in transformers, I just got a quote for a, a, a four megawatt transformer, 35 kV, 600 volt is $109,000 from the factory and it takes 31 months to get it. So if you're building all that stuff for a project that's going to meet your daily needs, the economics of adding on to that and expanding it and maybe double or tripling the capacity will get you there. This thought. All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, with that, I want to bring us to a close. Um, and thank you all for your participation. Patty, do we have a tentative date for our next meeting? And I know you and I have not discussed this. So uh, why don't you just surprise me with it? Sounds good. Um, so just reminders, the meeting recording will be sent out via email after this after this meeting. And then um, as always, a calendar invite will be sent for the next meeting. We're looking at Tuesday, December 5th. We've been doing these first Tuesdays of the month, which seems to work well. Um, and then alternatively, you know, January. So just keep an eye out for that. And um, a reminder that presentation suggestions are always welcome. So if there's things that you'd like to see or things you'd like to share, um, feel free to email myself or Erin. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Patty. Again, we'll get the recording out to you. Uh, you'll see invitations if we have your email address for the December 5th meeting. Uh, you can always be in touch with Patty if you are not getting uh, any of those communications. And I want to thank all of you for your participation and uh, the great comments and discussion. Um, I really appreciate this group and uh, some of the issues we're grappling with. And we'll see where we can get this report uh, by the next meeting. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your day. And um, happy Thanksgiving, because that will pass before we talk next. See, see you all later. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Take you. care, y'all. Thank you.